Hi, Ryan. How are you doing? Oh, Rachel, I am feeling fantastic. I'm ready to go. You're bringing the yum yum? Oh, of course. That's my job. That's my duty. That's my honor. I've got a million medals pinned on my chest because of how much yum yum I bring to this fucking podcast. That's that's where I'm at, Rachel. How about yourself? Are you bringing the yum yum? N- not really. Not really? Yeah. How about you clarify for new listeners and old why we are called Yum Yum Podcast? What's the yum yum? Why, how, when, who, what, where, all of that. Please. Because the season two finale of Star Trek Discovery mm, great gave show. us the line Yum Yum with Commander Nandi. Yeah. What a, and that what a was line. her response to being asked to murder somebody. Yeah. Murder the main antagonist of the series at that point. Do you want to murder the main antagonist? Yum Yum was her reply. She said it sexily. She licked her lips, threw her hair back. It gave me an erection. It gave you an erection. We all got erect and we had to name ourselves after it because how could we ever forget? How could we ever let it go that this was a moment that happened? And we started out as a Star Trek Discovery podcast. We ran out of Star Trek Discovery. So now we are doing Babylon 5 one episode at a time. We are rewatching the series. We are going through it. There's going to be spoilers, but since the episode we are doing for this one is a fairly self contained story, I'm going to say if you haven't seen the show outside of this episode before, stay along. There's not going to be really anything to spoil for you because also we've made sure to not have one too spoilery because we do have some guests joining us for this one, Rachel. Some guests who are working their way through Babylon 5. Are you are you good to do the formal introduction, the yum yum induction here for these people? Introduce them, give them the hazing that we give every guest of the yum yum podcast? Nah. No, you don't want to? No, oh, fine. We've got. No, I, I just want to go back to cry asleep. Oh, you want to go back to cry? But Rachel, if you go there too long, you won't be able to cry. Oh, and it dries out my tears. It dries out your tears. And isn't that the real well, tragedy? When you die, I won't be able to cry. It'll be <sighs> fine. It'll be fine. So we are actually joined by uh, some hosts of a fellow Babylon 5 podcast. We are joined by Steve and Sean from the Last Best Babylon 5 podcast. Hello, fellas. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. I'm I'm good. I'm ready to get hazed. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not ready to let's, get Let's haze. Uh, haze. Please uh please don't and uh please leave me alone. I'll take but it. I'm I'll very, take Sean's haze. But I'm happy to but I'm happy to be a guest on the on the show. I'm very excited. Yes, yeah, very happy to be here. Thank Please you for don't hurt me, us. but uh, I'm here to. <laughs> I'm have very fun. excited. Okay, so first uh, rule, first uh, piece of business: hurt Sean. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you got me. I'm scared of pain. <laughs> Please no. Death is ah. inevitable. Watch out. So, ah. uh, as we've already kind of gone through, you are Sean and Steve. Please introduce yourselves. Tell us about who you guys are and what your podcast is all about. Hello, Steve, you, I'm Steve. You go ahead. You do yes. the main stuff, and I'll I'll add a little uh, color commentary. You do the heavy lifting, Steve. Yeah, I'll do. Yeah, and then Sean will come in for the for the 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 pin. Um, I'm Steve. I am a co-host of the last best Babylon Five podcast. There's three of us. Uh, two of us are here. Uh, one day Ben will will join you in, in Yum Yum Land, hopefully. Uh, and my friend Ben has seen all of Babylon Five, and Sean and I have not. So we are watching through it episode by episode, and we are giving our honest to goodness opinions about it, much as you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I'm having fun with my friends. You know, okay. I'm having fun with most of the episodes. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> especially, especially this Bringing one. Endorsement. Especially this episode, I imagine. <sighs> oh gosh, yeah. I'm just in a bad mood because we had to watch this episode. Um, no, <laughs> and we are from. Uh, we're all from Connecticut uh, in New England, and we all have moved to Chicago. Mm. Uh, so we're we're a bunch of uh, Midwestern transplants. Interesting. This year happens. We've all fun. lived in Chicago for for a, a good long while now. Now a decade plus. So decade plus, yeah. Con- Connecticut yeah. is where you guys are originally from. Did you know that the television series Soap took place in Connecticut? Soap had the pivotal character of Benson, 
who would have a spin-off sh- series called <laughs> Benson. Oh, this, it all this comes again. Back. I knew soap. I, I watched what? a little bit of soap. Well, Rachel, Rachel, you're confused. This is well, this is the this is the yum yum hazing of on your this show. I told you on your yeah. show, Steve infamously did not know that Benson was a series about a grown up oh, black bu- butler, but I instead, remember that. but instead thought it was the series known as Webster. Okay, and I have never I let it go. Webster. Yeah, that's fine. I deserve it. I'll As take, Red like, I said, would I'd say, "You're it. a dumbass." I said, "I'd take it," that? and here I am. Here I stand. It was such a yeah. fall from grace that no one realized that that Ben, the most knowledgeable one about TV on the show, walked in there first, saying, "I don't even know what Becker is," which was the craziest revelation there. But yeah. Steve took it away by. Bravely saying, yeah, Benson's about a little, a little black boy who's really in a rich white family. <laughs> Egg. Jesus. All I on didn't know what, Be- what Becker was. That's ridiculous. Becker I know. A, it's a, a Ted Danson Ted classic. Ted Danson. It has Dax uh, in it. Dax. There you go. Ryan didn't know what diagnosis murder was. Hey, we all have our blind spots. I didn't know what diagnosis murder was, but now I've been informed. So we've all grown up and we've all grown up over this last year. How did you get past security? So who done it? The greedy young wife, the bitter ex-partner, the neglected daughter. Well, who's left? How about a sister? Twice the suspects means double the mystery. Well, that's worth looking into. Let's go. Diagnosis murder Monday. You guys, you two specifically have not seen Babylon 5 before having to do it for your podcast. So is that the history with that? Is is that right? You both haven't seen it before doing this? Uh, what is your general relationship and history with, with Babylon 5 itself as, as, a, as, a, as a sci-fi show? Uh, yeah, I'd say for me, like literally nothing. Like I really like Babylon 5 before we started watching it, I knew pretty much no- I knew that it was the main thing I knew about it was in relation to Deep Space Nine because mm. I've seen all of Deep Space Nine. I really love Deep Space Nine a lot, um, and I knew it was like compared to it. And there was a you know it's believed that perhaps Deep Space Nine ripped off the premise of Babylon Five, mm-hmm. uh, which I could see the evidence and for, characters I, I, and uh, everything, yeah, yeah, I could see it. And, and I think Deep Space Nine is great, uh, distinct from Babylon Five, from what I've seen. But Agreed. Uh, I, I could definitely see that. Um, they move away, like they started in a similar place, but they yes, diverge mm-hmm, fairly quickly. That's what it feels like. Yeah, um, and, and prove it in and court. I knew that you know, it, prove it in court. Yeah, prove it yeah, in court. Prove it in court. You know. Yeah. Do it. Do what you evidence? did with the. Um, with the the George Harrison with the uh, the George Harrison song it was it was uh, he was sued over it anyway. Um, <laughs> what other there was a uh, reference to go with that's, like there's that's so Sean, many that so many examples that's Sean that's Sean for you go for the vague one that you can't even remember if you know uh, my sweet lord it's a song is my sweet lord uh, by George Harrison. And it well, was a song by the Chiffons called thank me, He's So Fine. Because I gave you time to Google that clearly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I just oh, the and he has to pay. He had to pay. It was uh, in court. Welcome, to, prove that welcome it to the Yum Yum Hazing, Sean, where we call oh, out. The hazing. Sounds like somebody's reading from the website this time, huh? So um, you were saying you, you weren't as familiar with it, but you, you did know the DS9 kind of connection before walking yeah. into B5. And I knew that it has like a five year plan to it. I knew okay. that. I knew it was kind of pre planned. That but that's it. That's all I know. I knew some of the characters by sight, just I, I think watching T V in the nineties, like you see Londo, like you see Jakar, and it's like, okay. And my friend used to collect these like micro machine toys and he got a bunch of Babylon five toys, not ever watching the show. Mm-hmm. So I was familiar a little bit with like some of the the spaceships and i knew who some of the characters look like uh but that's that's about it and ben has been on my ass about babylon 5 for like 10 years he's like you gotta watch the show you gotta watch the show it's so good and uh if it wasn't on the same streaming service as the sopranos i don't think i would have done it (laughs) But, and that's uh, a thing. That's a thing. In the last year or so, B5 has had a huge resurgence with a HD remaster being available on streaming yet again, a reboot in the works. It's uh, It's been uh, on the tip of people's tongues for who have not watched it but have been aware of its existence to be pushed into actually wanting to give it a go. And with you guys, it was you guys did a pod. You guys are doing a podcast and it was available on HBO Max and all of this stuff. While here we have to get it on iTunes and I, I have the DVDs. I'm not going to pay again until you know for it i'm I'm happy with my dvds with the crazy morphing menus 
So yeah. Oh, they were fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Why do anything else? Yeah. And you guys uh, have an interview with Jinxo himself, Tom Booker, which I think is we very important that everyone should check that out because I've never seen anyone chase up Jinxo before, and there's a wealth of stories in that interview that you guys had with him. He was uh, Jinxo in Grail, which was mm. the worst episode of anything I think I've ever seen. Yeah, it was, uh, but it he was, was down there for me. Yeah, so it was bad. he was so funny and so gracious, and uh, a lot of great stories about the cast, about like behind the scenes stuff, about how he got his costumes at J Crew. Mm. Um, great, just an all around great guy. Uh, yeah, some fun uh, David Warner stories and. Um... Yeah, he did a lot of story. He was in the the Chicago comedy scene back in the day, so that was a fun connection we made. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was a great guy. A, a delightful interview. You can't do that. I've got to stay here. Please, I don't care what you do to me. Put me in jail. Make me clean the methane and toilets. I don't care. I've got to stay on the station, or it's the end of the station. And every man and woman and child and alien on the station, just like all the others. I do believe I gave one of you gentlemen the DVD description for this episode. So please refresh us all on which episode we'll be watching and what is the plot according to the DVDs, which I don't know who wrote them, but I have to assume it's JMS himself. Episode 5, The Long Dark. A drifting, century-old spacecraft carries a crew person, quote, Anne-Marie Johnson, in hypernetic sleep. And something else. A phantom-like spaceling that a self-styled prophet, quote, Dwight Schultz, unquote, calls a soldier of darkness. Yeah. So this is The Long Dark. Rachel, tell us about your relationship and history with this episode. What has been your journey with The Long Dark? I don't like it. What? (laughs) I've never really liked this episode, and I find Franklin deeply disturbing in this episode. What? Say what? But this was written by Scott Frost, not at all a guy who writes creepy things in all of his material, including Twin Peaks. What are you talking about? You fu- Well, I'm sure. But see, okay, so you've never liked this episode, huh? No. From day one. Has it ever changed on your rewatch? Has you, have you ever grown? I just to- like it more. Interesting. So this is one of those B5 episodes that the more you've watched it, the more and more unpleasant it's become. Because, like, on the first couple of watches, I was just like, you know what, they're they're trying to do a thing. Mm -hmm. And I I get that it's connected to this lore and they're building up this thing. But then I'm like, no, because everything feels so deliberate in its shittiness. <laughs> it's like they made yeah. a choice and every choice was wrong, but not in a way where it makes it a complete fucking dumpster fire that's fun to watch because no. it's also boring. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> crime. Is is not only offensive, but it's offensively dull. I mean, we just talked about recently the, A Distant Star, the one mm-hmm. with Dr. Jacoby. Again, the Twin Peaks stuff in season two is just weird. And the, that episode we found dull and boring, but we didn't find it offensive. And in a way, that kind of made it hard to talk about. Well, this episode here, my history is similar to yours. I saw this episode. I, I went, oh, 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 I've seen this type of episode in Star Trek before the shitty romance story oh. that really reduces the quality of your character and the yeah. shitty monster of the week plot. Oh, okay. We're we're in traditional boring I sci-fi. Want my stranger of the week. We want and- our stranger of the week typical story, not our monster of the week. But we do get strangers here. But uh, no, I uh, I've never liked this one. And you you and I are on the same wavelength. The more I've watched it, the more I've grown to despise it because. It is a clear example of an episode written by somebody who's never worked on the show before Mm. and has no attachment to any of the characters because they're all wrong or they're all off in some way. They're all disingenuous. And the plot itself is so basic and uh, entry level. It's it's almost Forbidden Planet, the invisible monster that you shoot at it with lasers and you see its outline, that that isn't enough to guide you along. So what do you have? the character work and this is a especially in season two where the character work has been uh, pretty strong or nuanced especially on the sheridan front where they're trying to introduce us to sheridan that was until 
this... it was non JMSF. No, but even, but even then, a distant star still had some interesting character work here. It's all off, and it reminds you of how season one was with episodes like Grail, in which you have writers who are brought in because they're friends of JMS or their colleagues or he- people he admire, but maybe they don't write to this type of show, and maybe they don't understand these type of characters. So the more I've watched it, the more upset I've been in that regard, especially when it comes to Franklin, as you say, who I feel this is a character assassination of Dr. Franklin, who at this point is although led inadvertently to the death of a child, still been one of the more morally uh, upright characters Mm. in our human crew of people, and one with strong convictions. So I've never enjoyed this. So we've got to toss it over to you guys. You guys have done an episode on this where people can listen to it, but tell us about what it's been like for you guys to watch this and to revisit it. Yeah. um, Yeah, no, I... I feel pretty much the same way. I, I upon rewatching it, I, I honestly don't remember how I felt about this when we recorded this show. I think I was middling. Um, yeah, I, upon rewatching, yeah, I was very bored. Um, and I, I was just, yeah, uh, the the plot with um, like the the a plot is is okay, but not particularly interesting. Um, I thought some of the Garibaldi stuff connecting with him with him was was okay, but it's it's not super compelling it feels like a lot of like lore build up for something that we kind of are still kind of shady about mm. so it's sort of not all that interesting yet um but then yeah you have the franklin plot which is horrible like it's like it's so bad <laughs> um and it's like yeah like you said you know it's at least that episode with the kid who dies is like interesting and like it raises like a moral question and it's about franklin um, the whole yeah, and it's about, episode's Franklin. about Franklin making and morally it's dubious choices. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, it's okay for Franklin to be morally dubious and sometimes do the wrong thing. Like, that's interesting, you know? Yeah. But but in this case, it's it's like, it's just creepy and weird and, and it's never really interrogated how bad it is. Um, it's just kind of shown to be like a normal romance. Yeah, and it's, like, it's, it's very not. odd because... Like, watching it, I was trying to figure out if they were trying to frame it more as, like, she's struggling and she wants some emotional connection and she's reaching out to Franklin because... But it's all on his end. Yes! And I'm like, this guy, he's like, my dick is here, do you want it? And she's like, I can't cry. And he's like, yeah, but do you want to kiss? Yeah, and then he's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's just like, but but, but you put your dick in my hand. Yes. The biggest alarm, I, and and Steve, I, we talked about this in our episode. I think the biggest alarm bell that rings out for me is when she like, um, when she like passes out, and then she wakes up, and he, she, they're in his quarters, and like, yeah, we weren't close enough to the med lab. It's more convenient. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, yeah, what? I, she was with me the whole night. Like she was ugh, with me. The whole night. he does to her is unacceptable. It's so and it's bad. funny because like, the show, ugh. I think Rachel, to your point, like the show seems to know it too, like. It's not as though this was something that you watch old shows sometimes. It's like, well, this sucks, but that's kind of how it was. Yeah, um, TNG is mainly like it. that. You know, yeah. TNG with Deanna yeah. Troy, most of her plots are like that, where it's like, it's gross, but it's like, it was the times, and they're not acknowledging how gross it is. But here, they do acknowledge it, but yeah. they don't explore it any. Yeah, because he like because they kiss, and like, then he's like, oh, this isn't appropriate. Don't. And it's yeah. like, oh, come I on. I shouldn't have done that. And don't then later, there. Sheridan's like- <laughs> Don't look at it. Don't look at me kiss yeah. this we lady. We both know that it's there and we're kind of lampshading it, but don't look at it. But also, Just like the monster. Just don't, the outline's but, there, just don't look at but it. But then the question is, what else do we look at? Like, what yeah. else is there to investigate or explore in this episode that is, again, it is a character-driven episode. The monster doesn't really matter. It's about the character journey of Franklin and Garibaldi in these uh, in this episode, the A and B plot of those two characters. But then what is there to explore there other than this feels out of place for Franklin? Well, I think that they want us to wonder if she's the monster. Fair enough. But um, I want to hear more from you, Steve. So what about you? you you've yeah. already indicated you're not a fan of this episode. Not a fan. Of course not. Well, for all the obvious reasons... Um, I didn't like it the first time, uh, and I was so, by the way, so thrilled that this was the one you picked for us to watch again. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, what a delight to have to, uh, a, a small piece of my wow. finite life, I have to watch this again. Wow. Oh, uh, a little whiny, huh? <laughs> nice. Wow. Little, uh, but no, it was, mad, huh? uh, I, the Franklin stuff sucks, obviously, and what also kind of sucks for me, and I, I 
it bothered me a lot more this time around. It was like the big tease at the end. I don't know. Should I go into the go, end? Go, 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 to, go, go. Uh, is that Jakar has uh, looked into this mysterious planet on the rim mm -hmm. where ancient evil forces are gathering. And it's like, okay, well, that's a little interesting, I guess. But Babylon 5 seems... Yeah, and it's like, but Babylon Five to me, the the villains seem to be like white supremacists, uh, uh, corrupt politicians, um, ambassadors who double deal, like very human villains. And to have this tease that like the big war that's coming is going to be giant horned, invisible Draculas, like or at least those uh, are their foot soldiers. Like the bad guys' foot soldiers are demon monsters. You could say that they have a dominion of sorts. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean that is a little bit more interesting. But like, I don't care about monsters on a show like this. Like, w with a show with Bester on it, it's like I don't want to see a monster. I'm sorry. I'd rather see the psychor. No, I I, I, under creepy. I understand that. And all I'll say is, and you've seen it already. The way that they're handling it is, you know. The monster villains, they obviously are on the periphery, but who's their representative? A human face called Mr. Morton. That's their representative. That's a character you, you've engaged with yes. already in this show. He's, yes. he's clearly yeah. around, and that's far more interesting. And to go with the DS9 comparisons, obviously, uh, to go there, I don't know how you feel, but it's like... Yeah, I'm far more interested in the Vorta than I ever am in the founders themselves. I'd rather hang out with Wayun talking oh, to yeah, me well. than any oh, of yeah, the yeah. changelings. The I'd rather... Yes. Absolutely. It's Jeffrey Combs. I do and it's Jeffrey that. Combs. Jeffrey and Combs being like, uh, my people lack a sense of aesthetics. Being a I will say, though, freak. that the one thing I liked about this episode is that Londo really gets a chance to be a piece of shit. And I always love that. He does. Yeah, that's um, yeah. there's a funny line. Because there's he knows about... Mm-hmm. Like, even divorced from what we know about Londo, that he kind of knows about all this stuff, and he's kind of, like, keeping a keeping it on the DL. Like, he's just, if we just remove that, he's still just an asshole where everyone's like, there's a giant Dracula that's sucking up guts. He's like, this sucks. Is Fuck he you. Wrong? I'm out of here. Is he this wrong, is though? Is he, he wrong? He did not react like that to the feeder. <laughs> no, no, he because that was something he knew <laughs> and was afraid yeah. of. And grew, but but yeah. is he but he's he wrong to treat it like this, where they've called this big diplomatic meeting about what is basically a security problem that security should deal with? Like, why should he even yeah. care? Like, that's another thing that's weird about this episode. Is, well, no, no, and Kosh don't even turn yeah, up. Yeah, the Mindari and Kosh don't even show up. But here's a thing that I think is very odd. Why, why not Kosh? Why not? But because he's too busy need... chilling out watching human history on his TV yeah. screen. <laughs> well, they don't even Kosh need an so actor. They don't need an actor. They just put the costume Kosh. there, and that's it. <laughs> but but what Steve, a here's the thing. Freak. I love here's him. the thing. You remember, <laughs> Kosh? Kosh is not interested in doing the no. B five mission statement, but he's there anyway. And why is the question? He's, if just, he's not interested. He's just why there, is he there to speak in riddles and exactly. be cool and be sexy. I love that guy. So, uh, oh yeah, yeah. He's the hottest guy there. So, <laughs> but next um, to Lou Welch, of course. But, <laughs> Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next to Lou, this next episode Lou. could have used Lou Welch. Of course, you could win this. Uh, you don't. You lose a level of uh, of of sexiness and uh, beauty, and uh, yeah. So it's it just you're just you're just uh, up Shit's Creek without a paddle. You know, you don't got Lou there. But to kind of touch on a thing of in most episodes that have to involve the alien count the the, the council, there's and usually and a, league specifically and league and all of that. There's usually a uh, political angle because they're political characters. Think about Death Walker. That's an episode where all the aliens come in and there's a political crisis at hand, but it doesn't make sense for a monster of the week crisis. So when Londo's being a dick, all I could nod along, I just nod along going, yeah, why the fuck are the diplomats even engaging in this monster yeah. plot? What the fuck is this? Yeah. Because hey. we need to remind you that these characters are in the show and that Jakar has an interest. And then so the tease at the end with him looking at the book hits all the more hard because we've seeded it throughout this singular episode in case you haven't seen the other episodes. That's why it's there. It's not because it actually ties in with the themes of the show or how the structure usually works. You can tell this is a guest writer who's come in and JMS says, I want you to tease out these plot points here. Do it somehow. Off you go. Yeah. And it's also like, I do feel like at this point also, um, the, the, the person who kind of wakes up from like an 100 years sleep or whatever, I feel like I've, it's one of those things that feels like it's been done a lot. Um, like in Star Trek, they do it uh, in TNG, obviously. And, um, I mean, later on they in Futurama, Voyager. they do it, obviously, but that's later. They do it in um, Futurama. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, it, it's just one of those things where it's like that 
aspect of it is already kind of like, eh, like it's not super, I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it has enough space to really be interesting. And then obviously it's ruined by the, the creepiest plot in the world. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, I honestly, yeah. Who thought of that? Scott Frost. Who okayed that? Who Scott Stanford? Frost. Scott oh, Frost, who Scott did the exact Frost. same shit in Twin Peaks and in the Twin Peaks books. Yeah. Oh, Let's just say, you know. What did he write in Twin Peaks? I don't remember. So he Does was it... a major contributor to everybody's favorite plot of, uh, 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 what's her name with the eye patch? Um, Nadine uh, falling in love with oh, a teenage sure, boy. Sure, sure. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm gonna say, oh, okay. I'm gonna say this. All I right. kind of enjoyed that plot. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. Because it was so, because it was so insane and weird that I was and, kind of, I kind of enjoyed it. But it's it. creepy. It you is know. very creepy. It's bizarre. It's very strange. I don't want to talk with you. I don't want to walk with you. I don't want to see you. I don't want to know you. Is that clear enough to understand? Or do I need a court order to get my point across? Mike Nelson, you are the handsomest boy I've ever known. And I would really like it if you and I could go out on a date. I want to talk about something that, uh, Rachel, you and I have gone over in yeah. previous discussions of Babylon 5 and even Star Trek Discovery and on our Patreon when we talk about Star Trek, of how there are certain things within an episode before the story starts, before dialogue even happens, that lets you know off. that lets you know you're in for a shitty episode. Yeah. There are certain things okay. like CG shots or costumes or characters. Like when you watch a TNG episode, say, there will be an episode and you have the beginning of the plot and you go, okay, this seems mm-hmm. fairly normal. And then they'll transport the people on board and it will be space Irish with goats. And and, oh, and, sure. and, and yeah, you go, oh, like, this okay, is bullshit. Well, this is going to be the worst this, thing. I've this is going to be oh, bullshit. Yeah. And oh, some yeah. of that can be, happen with production, such as you see the strange man of the week and they're wearing this ugly sweater. And they're an Australian, and you go, oh, they're wearing some for they're some bullshit Australian, this week. Yeah. And then with this episode, I had that immediately with the music. We kick off the episode with a musical sting on a CGI spaceship, and it sounded almost identical to Dr. Evil's theme music. Mm-hmm. Really? Okay. What have you got? And that's a little sign, because if you pay attention, the music in this episode is doing some fucking heavy lifting, because what is there on the screen? There's so many musical stings. The music is really uh, extreme in comparison to other episodes. There's yes. lots of use of I electric guitar stuff. It's it's great, but it's also... There's a theremin in there There's at a one theremin. point. This is like spooky. Yeah. And, I love it when they throw a theremin in there. You gotta but, love that. We notice these type of things, don't we, Rachel? Like, well, how are you with this type of stuff when it came to this episode? Because we're rewatching, we know how the plot goes, but there are some warning signs of things like that when you watch a shitty episode that lets yeah. you kind of know before the plot even kicks in that you're in so, for some fucking bullshit. Yeah, and then sometimes when you're watching it, you're like, oh, maybe maybe they're just having an off moment. Yeah, maybe the budget isn't there. And today. then it just snowballs, and then it's just like, oh, just. You you're trying too hard. Yeah, that's the problem with a lot of these decisions. It's just like, oh, we have time to make some music. Yeah, so we're gonna make some music. We're gonna make it big. We gotta have uh, Reg Barclay act his heart out because the script is lacking. We've got to have the actress of Moira Mariah Cirrus go fucking over the top too because there's nothing for her there there to work with her. We've got to have. All of that kind of stuff here, and I was noticing it a lot with this episode. I, I already don't like this episode, but I was noticing it over like, oh, okay, we're going to have this music. These music stings are so overt. We're going to have the monster be invisible. 
that's always a great sign of quality <laughs> to come. Always, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just fighting. Uh, just not. He's fighting nothing. And the classic. Uh, and getting, yeah. The classic bad low production, or even just cheap sci-fi shit of the first-person cam of the monster running at a person, and they scream in the camera, and that's the ad break sting. There's things like that in these shows, especially back in the '90s, that lets you know you're in for a, a lower quality episode, like. Put this episode next to the very first episode of the season, or Geometry of Shadows, or or others, and you just go, it's night and day. And it's not necessarily you put it on the director, but there is something there within episodes of TV of this time where you have warnings in the production that you are going to have a lower quality episode. And it's not just because B5 has a lower budget than those other shows, because we've seen TNG and Voyager and, and, and Deep Space Nine and all these do these exact same things as well. Mm-hmm. Like, and you we've seen those shows be better as well. Yeah, like, you don't need to wait more than 10 minutes to know that The Meridian is a bad episode of Deep Space Nine. You can just tell yeah. visually straight off the bat yeah, that there's going to be some bullshit. Off. Yeah, just like, wait, 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 which, one, which one is that? The one where Dax falls in love with a guy and wants to stay on no, a planet. No, no. That's the Brigadoon planet one. Oh, yeah. that's one of the worst. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I just had a horrible <laughs> memory of that. that exactly, stupid exactly. And you can she tell. You can tell it's shit. That boring guy <laughs> and she wants to live on that fucking planet it sucks it sucks so and you can tell it sucks ass before uh, they get to that plot point even no you don't have to wait God damn you don't have to wait uh and that, that just like that just came rushing back to me as like a horrible memory oh <laughs> uh, they got to pump out 20 of these 25 of these a year and they're just like ah uh, they're just not all going to be good i'm sorry yeah have a cave episode well, we only have a cave oh, set for today, sure, yes. so have yeah. the cave episodes. Oh, oh the, the, the TNG town set. Oh, the TNG town set, where it's like, oh, yeah. we've got to have it in a town. We have that fountain. one set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the stairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. It's in the greatest episode, the inner light, but it's also in that episode where Data is irradiated and he's walking around the town of villages being like, beep, yeah, boop, I a, don't have memory. Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> They're but, like, they can get, sometimes they can really, I will, like, my, my thing for, yeah, for those shows, for specifically TNG and Deep Space Nine, is like sometimes they can get away with some dumb bullshit just because the cast is very charismatic, and it's like, like even that episode, I think back, I'm like, oh yeah, it's just it's Brent Spiner just being like, oh, I don't know, I do not like it's just I remember that. So <laughs> yeah, there, there is like a fond memory, and of they have a that. they have a higher caliber of poor writers too. Like their bad episodes <laughs> could be a little bit better. <laughs> That was a mental gymnastics to get but there. He's, but he's right because TNG, <laughs> I, TNG, yeah, exactly sometimes it can be just insane. Like you get an episode like Sub Rosa, and then it's just like this an is amazing insane, episode. But I cannot look away from this absolute trash fire where Beverly Crusher is talking. She has she has the line where she's like, "I was mm-hmm. reading. Uh, I was you know." <laughs> I had a sexual dream last night after reading from my grandmother's diary. My grandma. <laughs> and Deanna Troy, the empath, is like, tell me more. She's like, oh. Tell me yeah. more. It's like, what the hell well, is going on? Well, fudge, because that's my character. Yeah. But you're right. Oh, I thought that that was when they were working out, because that's no, the reason that's she's another, late. That's another scene. Because they're temporal. That's but, but, the episode where it's like she falls in love with that creepy guy right you yeah know, yeah the creepy man. guy who would go on to be uh, a bajoran <laughs> in uh deep space nine yes. the one that major kira is in love with hey, you're forgetting yes. the most important and- line from sub rosa which oh, is- don't like that candle oh. <laughs> They got they got an Irish guy to play a Scottish guy. See, see, no, 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 no. No, but seriously, doesn't he die? Doesn't one of those guys just like die suddenly? Yeah. I just remember Steve, Steve and I reviewed that episode a long time ago in the the what uh, the predecessor podcast to the Babylon Five. Where we had a podcast called Space Lincoln that Steve and Ben did. I was just a guest on it. Um, but uh, yeah, we Steve and I reviewed Sub Rosa, and I just remember like. One of like one of those Irish dudes like shows up on the bridge and is just immediately murdered. And like, he's supposed, yeah, that's dies. him. And he's supposed to be Scottish, played by an Irish guy. And there's things like that. That's what I'm talking about. Where you can immediately tell that they that this is going to be shit because look at that. They got a Irish guy clearly to play a Scottish guy, and you're already disconnected. Yeah, they all guys- sound the same to us here in the states. Uh, no, it's like yeah. oh sure, you can They're tell it's stage, false yeah. because you I'm have, just you I'm have just joking, Miles folks. O'Brien yeah. in the same fucking episode. So yeah, that's it's right. even more weird. <laughs> but oh, um, sweet Miles. Well, what do you guys think about that type of thing with with TV, especially back in this era where you're more noticing the lower budget or the constraints or the fact that this is, we're going to have 22 episodes a season, we're going to have filler episodes, we're going to have our bullshit episodes, where 
Do you guys notice that ever when you watch shows like this, like B5 or TNG, where you kind of notice just little hints before the story even kicks in that this is just going to be not great? That's a great question. I I would say for Babylon 5, I haven't noticed it because I when I watch these episodes, I try to be like as analytical as possible. So like, I'm not even really enjoying myself until it's over. Um, but except for uh, when lose on screen, right? Except for when lose on screen, then I yeah, that's just that's shit. just that's pure uh, pleasure. Or when uh, uh, Negrath is on screen, or mm-hmm. when um, oh or when God, Kosh Negrath. shows up. Uh, but I don't know. I, I I tend to be a little bit more forgiving, just because like the the grind that these shows had to do back then, it was like immense. Yeah. And I, typically, I know there's a better episode coming, especially with a show like this or with Star Trek. It's like, okay, you, you wet the bed with this one, but like, we're going to get day to day next. So like, it's fine. It all comes out in the wash. I, I know what you mean, though, because it's it reminds me of kind of like that that phenomenon of like, it, it, it almost feels more like a an older thing of like in the 90s when you're watching like a rerun or something like you're watching like a Simpsons rerun. And it's like, I'm going to keep an eye on the animation and see which season this is. Is this a later season or is this an earlier one? And like, that sort of thing. And it's like, it's and that kind of like gauges the quality a little bit of just like, Oh, am I in for a good time? Is this what I've seen a million times before? Is this going to be uh yeah, that sort of thing. I'm not quite there with Babylon five just yet, but it was uh, like in Dragon Ball Z. I feel like I'm going to get there the, at some point. What, 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 what like in Dragon, Dragon Ball Z when they had the, uh, like the really incredible animation studio working yeah. on that episode. Well, that was a different and then you turn uh, on yeah. the next one. And it was like, Oh no! It, yeah, this yeah. Is Dragon Ball Z. Animation studio. I mean, if if we're talking about, uh, we won't go too far into the anime realm, but d- d- back in the day, you know, Shonen anime in particular had to crank out like an episode every week and with no breaks. And so they, yeah, they had like three different animation studios. There was like one good one, one okay one, and one just terrible one. And yeah, it was like every time you started an episode, it's like, which one is it? It's like, does everyone's head look normal or does everyone look like an egg? Uh, and it's like, oh, everyone's got a weird egg head. All right, this is gonna suck. And it's just like, yeah, all this right, episode, yeah, this episode sucks. Rachel, yeah. do you, we 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 mm-hmm. we're talking about this in a way that it's a you know, oh, we can tell us bullshit. But do you because this doesn't exist as clearly with modern shows, especially like your Star Trek Discoveries, say, uh, where they look like a fucking movie and all of that. There's still some signs of troublesome yeah. e- e- elements, writing, 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 but. Do you kind of miss the the sniff test ability of older shows where you know, oh, I don't have to invest as much in this one, but this isn't going to be yesterday's enterprise. I know that because he is he is a a, a space Irish guy, or he is a, a Deanna Troy getting impregnated by a ball of light, yeah. or stuff like that. You know like, what I would like about that if that was a thing, particularly mm. with Star Trek Discovery, it wouldn't give you hope. Mm. You would know way more quickly that it's just worthless. Yeah, I kind of miss that with some modern shows because there is that element of the serialized nature and the element of I've got to pay attention to all the details because this will all matter in some way, shape or form. But I do appreciate an episode like The Long Dark in terms of it lets you know fairly quickly that there's nothing, there's nothing here. And you can skip it if you Move want. Move along, Traveler. <laughs> yeah, there's a, what what are they going to get from this episode? That the dark forces are coming like we already know dark that. Dark forces are coming and hey, check out a wonderful romantic plot with Dr. Franklin. <laughs> oh, moving kind of fast, aren't you, doc? I don't sleep with my patients. There's a difference though between a bad episode, especially like TKO where we can talk about how it failed because it actually was trying to do something of note. The Avonova something the story yes. in that is something of note, but it's a failure because of the other story around it. Here, yeah. this is a worthless episode. That's how I would <laughs> yeah. describe it. Because we can't we can't stroke our chin with this episode going, the, they tried to tell something here with it. No. You can't do it in the same way with a failure like TKO. Yeah. You can't. Like the TKO Ivanova at least subplot. had Zima in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, like the Ivanova subplot in that episode is is very nice. Like it's a nice little plot um, that is just a little bit of character development for Ivanova. And I, I still like that. And it has something um, but to yeah, say. And then like the Walker, the Walker Smith thing is just silly and <laughs> just like weird. Yeah, exactly. It's not that it's bad. Kind of, I mean, it's not it's, good, but it doesn't I don't belong. think it's as bad as, as Grail. 
Um, no. Grail to me yeah. is the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> but, uh, Survivors. Survivors but, is our bottom uh, of the grail for uh, bottom of the. Which grail one is that? Wait, which one is that? That's the one, one where we that... drunk again, Uncle Mike, where Garibaldi is revealed to be an alcoholic. Oh, well. yeah. That episode. And sucks. he goes oh. on the run. He goes on the run, and we meet Lou Welch oh, for the first yeah. time. Though. Oh well, we. We meet Lou. We meet Lou, and, and it's got Negrath, so it's a winner of an yeah, episode. I'm, yeah, you know I what? I can't yeah, put I that low because that has the scene where Garibaldi tries to get help from Negrath, and yeah. Negrath is like, "Fuck you, cop!" <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's like it's like the most aggressively like a cab scene. Yeah, in Babylon Five. A cab, except I've seen for Lou. So, far. so yeah, except for Lou. Lou is except a, for Lou. He's Lou, a treasure. It's okay. A treasure. It's okay, Lou. Lou. Uh, we love you, Lou. It's okay, buddy. Okay, love Rachel. You. Mm -hmm. I think it's time to crack open the main topic here, which is Dr. Franklin, and he is uh, oh how he's represented. Oh, yeah. What? You know that, that doctor that. that doesn't trust lurkers and definitely doesn't want to help them or, <laughs> like, you know, especially ones that are Don't mentally but, ill. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. But can we walk through what we think of Dr. Franklin as a character? You and I, briefly, because we've talked about it many times, we both like Franklin. Yeah. I like him. I think he's an underrated character, I think, although he doesn't get as much to do in the main cast of characters. When he is given stuff to do, it is poignant. It makes you have a journey. I think he's a good doctor character. He has strong convictions and flaws. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. Mm-hmm. Say that I like I like Franklin. I like his workaholic storyline. Yeah, I hate Franklin with romance. Well, it's, yeah, he's always such a fucking creep. Well, I disagree with you. Oh, I like that. Yeah, he he asked that lady out in uh, quality of quality mercy, of mercy, and, and that's that what I was going to say. I disagree with you in terms of like he's when they give him a romance skeevy to me. Really, because to me, this is the skeevy episode because it's written by somebody who doesn't know the character of Franklin. Because in the quality of mercy, that's written by JMS. He knows Franklin, and he gave him a cute little moment where he goes, "Hey, I'm a doctor. I'm working. I'm going on this crusade. But you know what?" I actually have a humanity, I have a warmth, and I actually want to go out on dates. I'm going to ask this lady on a date in a respectful manner, and it worked out, and it was cute, and it was nice. This episode is Scott Frost going, let, her, let him stroke her hair. I, I don't think that this is appropriate at this particular time. No, I, I guess not. I, it's just that I'm a little scared. We like Franklin overall. We like his character. This is the first time in our in our watching in which we don't like Franklin because of how they handled him. What mm -hmm. about you guys? What's been your journey with the character of Dr. Franklin? What do you think of him as a character, as a doctor in your sci-fi show? And how do you feel about how he's done in this episode? Yeah, I, I like Franklin just fine. I I, I, I enjoy him generally. I, I think he's uh, well acted and uh, usually pretty well written. Um, yeah, like I... I like you said, I, 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 and we discussed earlier, I, I like sometimes that he has to kind of put his ideals on the line and sometimes it really doesn't work out. Like, with yeah, the, don't forget, Sean, he's, he's, he's responsible for the most incredible B plot in any Babylon 5 episode, which wait. is getting everyone to eat diet food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> he does make everyone eat. And that is, listen, that is kind of fun because he's clearly like just, he just wants to screw with everyone. And it's pretty funny. But then um, he, in that episode when he's giving Ivanova hmm. her diet plan, which he refuses to acknowledge, is a diet. It's a food yes. plan. Um, he it's comments food on her she's lovely just borders. Like, oh, I, oh, geez. I, yeah, now I am the expanding Russian frontier, and his oh, response yeah. is with very nice borders. And then he smiles to himself <laughs> and, and walks yeah, away. Was, he's out. Like, he what says a that weird to himself. To <laughs> yeah, that was weird. And they that was a weird lie. Himself. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that yeah. was creepy. Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Whenever they, you're you're right. Yeah, whenever they dip into stuff like that, it's and, and in this episode, it's uh, everyone should be in jail. But um, but no, in general, yeah. I mean, in general, I like Franklin. I I don't really appreciate how he was treated in this episode. Um, and yeah, like I said, the the episode where that where the where the kid died. It's like that episode walked a fine line, and I think it did a pretty good job of it. Mm -hmm. Um, this one does not. This one, uh, falls off. They the don't line even try. They don't even try even to try. have a line. Yeah, it's. Uh, Excuse me. Anyway, Steve, Steve, go ahead. Ahead. There is a line. Excuse me. They do. He does not sleep with his patients. That's the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am not 
Creepy. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> I don't sleep hey, with my baby. I don't tried. sleep with my in that apartment. Yeah. No, and she yeah. was there the whole night. It's his little house. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got a little couch in his little house. <laughs> Steve, what about you? What's been what's been your relationship and dynamic with Doctor Franklin as a character, as a doctor in your sci-fi? What do you think of him? I got I got no problems with Franklin except for this episode. I think he's uh, typically uh, very consistent in his portrayal. Um, he's he always does things for the good of of people, and I think especially because, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, Babylon Five actually involves economics like people need mm. to pay for their medical care and franklin i think really represents this concept really well because he's like he runs a free clinic in the down below and he um an illegal one he, yeah yeah and elite yeah and and other things coming on in future episodes where he's like this guy is like doing everything he can in a system that sucks uh in a system that's very familiar to everyone at least in the u.s i, I can't you know, oh, yeah. speak for the Australian healthcare system, but uh, it's better than it's yours. A shit show over here. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Everything, we, every uh, every system better than yours. Technically, have universal healthcare. I know, yeah. But uh, at least yeah. you could even say that out loud, and people won't yeah. be like, "You communist." Yeah. Um, oh God. Oh Christ. But hey, Babylon Five does, like you say, Steve. It uses Franklin to explore some of these aspects, especially because in the show we are aware that there are lurkers, we are aware that there's poor people, but really you don't see it explored all that deep outside of the characters of Franklin and Garibaldi, the two who are the focus of this episode. Yeah, and Franklin's usually very good about that stuff, and you'll you'll see it in his actions and the way he kind of stands up for people. And then this episode comes along, and it's just like, what happens? Like, really, what happened? And yeah, you know, Scott Frost it's, happened, but it's weird. And it's like, yeah, you know, you know, it's going to be trouble when I, I, my, my alarm bells went off immediately when, um, he was bringing her to the, uh, I don't know, the cafe or whatever it was, and he was like escorting her like arm in arm, and it's like this seems weird. He I, that doesn't seem her necessary. Hair when she woke up, that was weird to me. Oh yeah, yeah. Like there was a lot of yeah. Also it, it's aggressively like, huh. strode. He petted her hair like yeah. a freaking. Well, dog. she was stressing like, out. He wasn't she was like stressing a out. A gentle. Yeah, still though. No, he's not what, a gentleman. When did they teach that in medical school? He's not a gentleman or a gentleman in this episode. No, no. He is a disappointment. <laughs> sorry, I think Franklin again. is a noble character. I think he is a guy that has. Um, questioned the status quo there's an episode that we've seen where garibaldi wants a guy uh, he wants to make sure that uh, a criminal gets killed but they can't do it so they're going to mind wipe him and he says to franklin make sure that the machine isn't turned on in a way where it doesn't hurt and make sure it hurts him and franklin objects to this and he even objects to the notion of the mind wiping thing he's a guy who recognizes the weird horrors of the world around him and actively is against them. He tries to do stuff. And I was grossed out, not just by this weird sexual stuff in this episode, but when push comes to shove and they have the Amos plot put in here and it's questioning her integrity, he sides with her and he says the lines of, like, can we even trust a lurker like him? And I said, yeah, Franklin yeah. would never ever say anything like no, that yeah. in his make fucking sense. life and it was disgraceful i was i was i was upset yeah. with that like the romance stuff is fucking gross and weird but but they the absolute character that was the real betrayal for it's you. a it's, it's a character assassination this is a guy who runs a free clinic for the lurkers he's not doing it out of uh, any like he's doing it because it's the right thing he's not expecting any reward he's going he's doing it illegally he could get in trouble he doesn't get because it's the right thing to do he's the guy that mm. objects to garibaldi's cop nature in our main crew of characters he's the guy that is willing to fight for the rights of a child even if it does in the end kill that child because nobody else he has convictions and to hear him say things like that because he's got a boner is is absolutely <laughs> fucking disgraceful. Yeah. Like, yeah, like he's really he he thinks with his dick in this episode. Are you suggesting I'm not doing my job? I'm suggesting if something is threatening this station, I'll do whatever is necessary to protect it. All this on the word of a lurker? Could this plot work? Could you, if you actually dedicated the time, could you make a plot about him? having a sexual or romantic entanglement with a patient, could that be something that you would actually want to see from this character? Or is that a line too far no matter what with him as a character? Um, That's a good question. Uh, I would say 
I would say yes, just because I feel like really any kind of like if you if like really I think in a lot of cases not not with every subject but like if you have really good writers behind it and it was really explored how bad it was that like and how wrong it was um, I think it absolutely could work um, but I think for me personally watching this I I think just the storyline would have been more interesting if. Franklin was just like helping this lady kind of get used to her new world as opposed to I, the, the romance almost felt like it didn't really even need to be there. Exactly. Um, like it just, it felt like it would have been more interesting for him as a doctor to be like trying to help this person acclimate. And then maybe he has, and he would have like, you know, an objection to people trying to like accuse this lady of being a monster or whatever, or having a connection with that because she's his patient and he cares about her because she's like, you know, she's not well and I've been trying to help her and like, yeah. you know, and that's ostensibly what he's doing here, but, but it's not it's because not he's the focus. being creepy. It's not undercut. You it's could undercut. Make, well, you, yeah, could, you could make an episode where it's, we had with believers, a clash between Franklin and Sinclair about what to do in a situation regarding somebody's uh, welfare. You could have the same here where he does not think it's right for Garibaldi to press her and give her too much information before it's right because she's just been woken up. Could you imagine the clash between those two? But that's not what this episode's about. No. It's not even what it's trying to be no. about. But uh, what about you, Steve? What do you think? Do you think if you if you if they actually did focus on a romantic entanglement with a patient plot, it could actually be something of note? Or do you think like with how Franklin is, how uh, how his character's been represented, even at this point in the show, is that just something that you wouldn't believe in? You wouldn't you wouldn't buy. I I think they could do it in a way that would be interesting, um, but ultimately they would have to err on the side of they're not going to pursue it. Um, just because of his morals, like mm. they could have, I could see this being very interesting where it's like, Hey, you're from a different world. It's a hundred years ago. Um, well, I, you know what? I think with the dead husband that kind of throws a wrench in things, like if you're hitting on someone who's mourning, uh, nope, but Hey, get rid of the husband yeah, and have it delete be the like, husband. this yeah. guy is help. Yeah. De- delete the <laughs> husband. Uh, have it be this guy is like trying to acclimate this woman into the future, protect her from uh, some dirty cops. And uh, in in so doing, it's like, oh, like we really have a lot in common. Oh, no, I'm falling for this person. Oh, no, I have to like distance myself from this person. Am I crossing a That'd line? That'd be interesting. Yeah, am I crossing yeah, exactly. the line of being have a carer the... to a potential lover? Yeah. Am I interfering with her development? And I, yeah, I think for something like that, too, Frankly, I think it would have to be like an A plot. I think it would have yeah. to be given more space oh, yeah, to be explored. To just like and, yeah, you can't make it like a yeah. yeah just you like can't make it a B plot. Was about the kid and his convictions about that. It was like, could you imagine if that episode of Believers, Franklin operating on the kid was the B plot? You would hate Franklin because it's <laughs> yeah. It would be you wouldn't have enough time to um, justify his actions. And even then, some people don't like his actions in that episode. But you have to make it about that, and that's the thing that frustrates me is. If you made this an actual plot about that, go for it. Actually, mm-hmm. go for it. Give us an ideology, a convictions. Give us an understanding of the grayness, the moral complexities. Because you know what this episode lacks from him? In Believers, there's that speech he gives about how doctors are gods. And it buys you into why he does everything he does as a character in that episode and in the series. Here, he has none of that. The closest you get is a petulant little tit for tat when they confront him about sleeping with a patient, and he just looks like, like a uh, dick. What? And he looks yeah, like, like the no, weak don't. one in that argument there. No. Yeah, and it's, it's I don't very uncomfortable. With my patients. It's very uncomfortable, and I don't think that the episode, just because they mention that, I don't think the episode actually knows that it's creepy and weird because the way that it ends no. is like on this note where it's like, maybe if you come back here, we could have some more smoochies. And she's like, perhaps. <laughs> well, originally, like, yes. he's just like, you're staying. Oh, right? you want to stay? I can help you oh, out. Yeah. I can help I can you help out. You need like, a yeah, place to, to stay? Huh? Yeah, he wants huh? to continue his, uh, his, Love his abuse. Uh, yeah. yeah like, now that that's over. Why don't we uh, smooch a little bit? <laughs> and it's odd because in a romance plot, they usually are the main A plot in these stories. And say what you will about their quality, if they're the focus, they're the focus. Usually you don't have them as the B plot in these sci-fi shows of yesteryear. Like 
the Loxana Troy episodes where she's with Odo. That's usually the main plot. Say what you will about the quality yeah. of those episodes, but that's the plot. Or the Great one episode. where she falls in love with the guy who has to commit ritual suicide, where that's also tackling some tough subjects. That's the mm. plot. Yeah. Or the yes. one where Deanna, or the one where Janeway falls in love with uh, the guy who's like a, a kind of like a, from a Nazi race who's afraid of telepathic people and they have to hide Kez and hide Tuvok. That's the main plot of her romantic entanglement with somebody who's morally questionable. You don't make that the side plot. You don't make it a shadow within a monster of the week plot because all it does is just aggravate you and say, why the fuck is this here? And in this case, you're saying, why the fuck are you ruining one of the most morally upright characters in our human cast? It's just like, if they made it just like a casual fling thing, like, oh, Dr. Franklin's ex- who's a, a doctor is here like oh yeah whatever franklin gets some smooching on the b plot who cares like whatever yeah, but bring back to, the lady to bring back june line. lockhart's daughter from that episode why not uh, where how did that go we yeah. don't know yeah but they don't <laughs> they don't try and it's so confusing of why is it here then i don't know is it there just to fill up time is this one of those scripts where there's just they didn't have enough actual meat to the bones of this because I don't know. It's just one of those things where yeah. I ask myself, JMS is a guy who has his he he's he's in full he's in a lot of control here and I don't know how he greenlit this. I don't know how he read this script and said, "Yeah, that's good for Franklin." I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's it is it does feel like one of those things like he's, we've said where it, it was like I don't know. You you would just see this shit in like sci-fi you know plots like this. It's like th- there was I guess a a thought at the time that it was more acceptable and and i think maybe like we said they thought they were making it kind of morally ambiguous but like they they weren't (laughs) they didn't do a very good job of that yeah it just seems very half-baked like Mm. someone someone in the writer's room was like let's throw a line in there where he knows he shouldn't have kissed her and everyone's like yeah "Uh, maybe that should be the whole episode it's like well the script is due tomorrow so that's all we're getting (laughs) so what about you what about me well, you're gonna need a place to stay, and this is as good a place as any. I can help. I thought about it, but I, I can't. Not yet, anyway. As disingenuous as it is for Franklin to say that he hates the poor, it is even more unbelievable to me, to me that the guy in a previous season who wanted to space all the lurkers reprimands another guy for wanting to do the same yeah. thing. But it's like, it's, but this yeah. guy's a war hero, like my friend Jeff. Last episode, well, he yeah. joked about. Spacing petty criminals. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, he's okay with them if they're similar to him. If they, if they, mm. if he shares something in common with them, it's fine. But if they, if he doesn't, then if they're different, then uh, he no, didn't they deserve steal to die. anything. He just didn't uh, have a permit uh, to preach. Okay, yeah. here's the difference, though, that I would argue with that is, you know, that in the series he's mentioned that he was also in the Minbari War. But would you say that he, as a character, and the show has ever labeled him as a soldier? Garibaldi. Uh, not really. I don't think so. Lot. He mentioned it not, here. I yeah, can't it remember comes up now. If they like, ever yeah. Yeah. like now they yeah, treat it like now. he's been labeled as the soldier man. Like Sinclair yeah. was labeled, and he's specifically yeah. identified yeah. himself as a Gropo. Yeah, ground pounder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, that that was much more. I mean, maybe just because it was like of of Sinclair, because it was much more Sinclair in the first season. Um, maybe that just kind of because I think they established that he was also there, but like, yeah, it almost feels like they kind of imported it to Garibaldi after Sinclair left. It's like, yeah, yeah we just have for to this give moment it. so far. Yeah, but I'm not talking about like continuity of like as a character. Would you fe- say that he feels as much of a soldier and military man as this episode is portraying it? Because that's my disconnect of they're treating it like, oh, you know, Garibaldi, the soldier, like. Ivanova feels much more like a soldier and a military person than Garibaldi. Garibaldi is a warrant officer. He's the guy who's like, yeah, I don't have to salute because, yeah, I'm a part of Earth Force, but I'm not a soldier man like Sinclair, like Sheridan, like Ivanova. So I ask you again, like, does this episode work on that level of he's trying to connect you to Garibaldi liking this guy because he's a soldier and they both have that in common? Does it work? Because have they built up to this in a way at all? (laughs) I didn't it's really believable feel to me it. just because I, I would say it's believable to me just because uh, here in the states, cops and the military are basically one and the same. So it's like mm-hmm. okay, all right, yeah, sure, all right. This guy's a, a a soldier. Yeah, that makes sense. They all are, aren't they? Yeah. So uh, that kind of made sense to me, but it 
it makes sense to me. I, Absolutely. I think it was more just like, um, I, I find it plausible that Garibaldi would have sympathy for this guy just because they went through the same thing. Um, and yeah, and, and yeah, in terms of like, yeah, the, the consistency, like the, the thing up just about him being, I, I don't know if I buy it entirely, but it's, I think it's maybe just due to the general, um, crumminess of the episode that, uh, like it, that's, I think that's why it kind of doesn't, uh, it doesn't pop off as, as the kids yeah. might say, as they all say, <laughs> while, they they all say while they're listening to Justin Bieber. Yeah. 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 It yeah. doesn't Justin pop Bieber. and lock. <laughs> Rebecca Black. Yeah. yeah. Like Rebecca yeah, but- Black. Yeah. Uh got 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 ya. <laughs> yeah, everyone's the guy favorite musician. Song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um oh, can I do a side note yes. about gotcha? <laughs> uh so y- y- the famous song is somebody that I used to know. Mm. Yes. Um and Gotya uh was living up around Lismore. Which is an Australian uh, town. Yeah, because it, like it's a university town. Um, but there's lots of hippies and lots of communes around. Mm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and I found cool. out cool. that somebody that my my brother knew, because my brother Lived went there. there, got into the hippie scene because he was a massive pothead, mm-hmm. um, found out that they actually knew the woman who was potentially – the woman that he wrote that song that he about, used to know? <laughs> that he used to know, <laughs> nice. and wow. the reason that he used to know her because they went out, mm-hmm. but then she up and left and moved to a hippie commune. Oh, don't you hate <laughs> it when that happens to you? Uh, you shouldn't have left me a hippie commune. I kept thinking to myself, oh, wouldn't this be better if you had this was Franklin dealing with Amos? He's an empathetic person. He's a yeah. doctor. He's worried about his health, maybe. But then I realized, and of course, this couldn't be the case because he's he's not in the series anymore. But if he was, I could see Sinclair handling this just fine. He would have been the guy because Sinclair as a character mm. was the guy who could sit down with anyone and have a warm conversation and look at them in the uh, eyes with Jeff. that empathy. I miss can't you, buy man. Garibaldi doing that ever with no. these type of characters. The kind of characters who are like performing crimes and doing all of this stuff here, I can't buy him doing that. It always feels like when in the season one finale when he's like, not Petrov, not my informant. It's like, oh, we never knew that he cared about a lurker S- Petrov. It always feels <laughs> like an artificial way to make <laughs> us like Petrov. Garibaldi because Garibaldi... Petrov! <laughs> <laughs> because it feels, no! because as we said, all cops are bastards. Garibaldi is a bastard cop, but he's a main character. You have to make him likable for mm-hmm. the audience in some ways. Yeah. And some yeah. of the ways they do it are fun, like he likes Banya Kata, he likes Looney Tunes, those yeah. are cute. But then some of them are forced, like, oh, Garibaldi does have a soft spot for some down and out people like veterans. Yes. And it feels disingenuous is the word. Veterans over who are and over. specifically like again, who have had the same experiences that he has specifically. Yeah. yeah. He, he likes them. Yeah. Yeah. He likes them. Really yeah. yeah. If yeah. he can see himself in somebody else, then that means that they're human and they're worthy of help. Where are we stationed? Nowhere special. It's here, hmm. there, just a grow pole. It's no big deal. I figured you for a ground pounder. Me too. It looks like we both missed our chance to be heroes. One of the things I want to ask you, Sean, specifically, but I think all of us is, we've talked about this in the episode, in our discussion, you mentioned in your uh, stuff is, you like the the lore aspect of, oh, this episode's kind of shitty, but it has the lore there, and that kind of, in a minor capacity, kind of uh, smooths over some rough edges. Mm. What about that works for you in these type of shows? And like... Where do you draw the line of it's a shitty episode, doesn't matter if it has lore in it? What do you think? Um, I mean, it really depends. I, I think it's a good question. I, I, I really think that, like, you know, it's uh, – that's a good – you've got me thinking now. I'm kind of thinking about this. Use your I, brain. I, I, like, like, exactly, yeah. Um, you know, like in this episode, I, I don't know if it really 100% works because it's like – I find it interesting. Like, I can at least say, like, if I can take anything from this, I guess is the way I think about it, is like, yeah, I'll take that. Like, I will remember the details of what they were talking about with, like, the the aliens on the rim or whatever and all that. 
I will remember that because I do think it seems like pretty emphatically that is going to come back in some way. So it's like it's kind of like I'm kind of putting that in my memory bank. So it doesn't really it doesn't make the episode good. Um, but I do I do like I like uh, yeah and I do I like media in general where things are kind of teased in like a in like an interesting way and then there is like a genuine payoff um and i do think and with babylon 5 i don't i don't know for certain obviously because i haven't seen it but i do think they are going to pay it off i feel like there is going to be something to this it does seem like it is going to and and i'm interested in like i i am genuinely interested in all this stuff with like the shadows and this this kind of other thing that's gathering and has kind of been in the periphery for a while um that is genuinely something that i find uh interesting like it piques my my curiosity so it's it's definitely like i at the very least i can be like huh but in in this episode in particular i other episodes have done it better Th- this one mm-hmm. in particular i i don't it just wasn't really like the the main storylines that it focused on were just 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 not interesting enough to really get my attention there there have been other episodes that have been way more interesting um specifically where that guy with the 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 human guy who helps Londo out that More guy than, and mm. exactly whenever that guy shows up I'm like ooh interesting you know what I mean mm-hmm. like it, it yeah, feels mm, like baby daddy this likey is, yeah. yeah daddy likey yeah, like um <laughs> and this, this episode when, uh, daddy Sean, what's that how about when the vicar showed up remember that guy yeah that was what, pretty wild wait, who, what about wait, him? Wait, how about the lore for that guy he was the guy with the yeah. computer chip in his brain when he took his hat off yes yeah oh jeez <laughs> how about the lore for that pretty Sounds heavy fun. stuff there <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 I am genuinely like, because I know that the show does have like this like five year plan or whatever, and I know that JMS kind of planned things out. I think my my antennae are up for for this a little bit. Like I'm just like, ooh, okay, yeah, more details on this. Oh, cool, I want to see more of this. Yeah. What about you, Steve? What do you think about that when it comes to? lore in an episode because uh sometimes with shows more even jump ahead more modern shows is you, you have a harder time being able to say oh that episode was shit because well it's clearly building to something so you know maybe in the you know how do you feel about law being in episodes and how, how much do you withstand it making up for a poorer quality story i i have a very low tolerance for like lore dumps like there was an episode in season one where I was like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't give it a good pass. Cause all it was, was just lore, lore, lore. Um, I think, and that's what I think is so great about Babylon five is that JMS is so, I got to give props to the guy. Like he weaves it into character moments. He weaves it into like themes of the show. He weaves it. So you don't even know that this lore is being delivered to you. So I think, in order for me to really enjoy lore or even like uh, have it be a, a positive thing, it has to be done really well. And props to JMS. Like you could tell he didn't write this episode because the lore is kind of clunky. Yeah. Um, like JMS is so good at it. Uh, but whenever it's done somewhere else, I'm just like boring. Like, I don't care. Show me uh, Lanier on a motorcycle. I'd, I would rather have a hundred motorcycle stories than, uh, like an episode about like uh, what is it Zaha Dune like the, mm. the the lore of this place like you want the goods like, now rather than the promise of goods later in a subpar story right yeah like this is a subpar yeah, story just, like, that it its well, lingering yeah. thing is we'll give you the goods later see look yeah. Jakar looked at his ancient bible book that had an alien that we saw in this episode what Ooh. yeah it's it's I, not I, enough I to make the episode when I saw that. what. Uh, it's not enough to make the episode good. No, it's not <laughs> a redeem. Like, no, it's not a redemption story that's successful. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's I, just it's enough to just make it kind of interesting, but not not good. Rachel, we've mm-hmm. we've kind of had this encounter where when we've criticized episodes of Babylon Five and of Star Trek Discovery, we've had some pushback from people saying, "Oh, but come on, you can't it hate this episode this. because it does this thing that will matter later in the show." And I do think that there is an annoyance there with a. Uh, uh, um, criticism of especially modern shows but shows yeah. like this where 
oh, I'm not allowed to criticize TKO because Walker Smith says, watch your back, and he gets shot in the back, back. right? Whoa. So, so you're not allowed to A revelation. Which was, so, which, was so, which was definitely intentional. They oh, definitely yeah. planned oh, that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, they did. They did. Absolutely. <laughs> he says it so many fucking times. Oh, but you know hey, what I mean there, Rachel? With, yeah. I, I can't criticize an episode of modern Star Trek or of the Orville or any of these shows where, where I have an issue with an episode because, oh, come on, guys. There's this thing that's obviously going to be important later, law or character thing, and it's like those things are obviously important and key to a story. But it's what Steve said of if it's naturally woven through, then it works even better. But I do want a good episode as but well. It, by the way, I don't also, want to be promised the mystery box format of "Don't worry, guys, we'll explain what the oh, island is in Lost." Fuck that. <laughs> but <laughs> one thing doesn't make an episode, and one thing doesn't ruin an episode. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes one thing can ruin an episode episode but like i think it's difficult often often i think it's just difficult when you have a show like this which exists in a time where we were just talking about it where there are some things where the episode's just shit and irredeemable and you can skip it the meridian there's nothing in the meridian of deep space nine that saves it but with the b5 episode with the b5 episode there's one or two little things that make it somewhat okay-ish because of what you say steve uh sean where Oh, this, this obviously this is building towards something, but it's like how much is a how much do you take and how much do you push to the side with that? And with this episode, I can't take it. Like I know, I know where things go, and I know what this all means. It doesn't mean that I sit back and go, oh well, that bit with the end with Jakar really ties it all together. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Fuck that. Jakar is like, making it has his weird drawing. That's like all, all Marvel, all the Marvel TV shows are kind of like that. It's mm. like all you do is spin your web. Like I'm. I don't care. I I'm gonna turn this off, and I did. I haven't watched one in a while because it's like I don't wow. really want to see you setting up blocks. Like, yeah, hot take. Come at me, nerds. Uh, I but yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's the frustration of mm. I get it. Serialized stuff is really great, and you're setting stuff up. Babylon Five setting stuff up, of course, but I still need an episode. Like yeah. like. Death yeah. Walker, we mentioned earlier, that's an episode with a bunch of shit in there. And obviously oh, with, episode, yeah. with the vicar in that episode, that's obvious setting up a bullshit. <laughs> but like you have an episode still. You have an episode yeah. where we can oh, discuss the discuss fun. themes and ideas and uh, uh, like, is this right? Is this wrong? Did this character have the right? Here we can't do that with the long dark. All we can ask is, why did they do this? Why did they... <laughs> Why did yeah. you do this, Scott Frost? And why, JMS, did you allow him to do it? Other than you like <laughs> Twin Peaks. Like, <laughs> what the fuck did you do here? I don't sleep with my patients. One of the things I think is interesting to point out is uh, uh, there's an alien ambassador, the one who's given the law mm-hmm. dump in the council meeting. He's uh, mm-hmm. he's uh, he's in a Markab. That's the name of that race. We saw them in season one, but they've given them a new redesign in this season, which is nice. It allows the actor to express themselves mm-hmm. more. But that That's actor good. is one of the three or four alien background actors that they have in this show throughout the entire thing. I had wrongly said in our Geometry of Shadows episode that he had been in season one. No, he has only just started in season two. He played the infamous green Drazi in that episode. Ooh. And he oh, is sure. this guy. So yeah. you'll see him again and again and uh sean it will tickle your fancy if you look this actor up on the imdb he's a markab okay, ambassador his name his name is kim strauss he is a very prolific actor in a corner of entertainment that you are a fan all of right, as well all right i'm One pulling up all. his imdb right now kim strauss all right I'm very promising already promising already with the play trailer and it is uh, a, an anime that i'm not familiar with but it is an anime uh oh he's <laughs> the first thing that comes up is his re- most recent credit is the way of the house husband, mm-hmm. which I which oh is, I've been, yeah I haven't seen this show. I know I've that it's about, about a that for, one. It's about a former mobster that becomes a a a, a working husband, um, mm. which sounds delightful. I haven't seen it, um, but okay, let's see. Oh yeah, he's in the oh right, yeah he's he's in Bleach. All right, yeah he's in. He's in the Blue Dragon game. Oh, that's very interesting. One of the many prolific anime and video game voice people that is just in B5. Yeah. Incredible. Naruto, Incredible. Uh, Romancing Saga. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is this is deep. We we're getting we're getting deep here. Suikoden. Samurai Champloo, which I'm currently watching. There you go. In. You better note oh, him down then. Is. You better there note you him go. down. I haven't. But, I've been watching. Um, I've been watching the original Japanese. I've not been watching the dub. Oh uh, well, Samurai you're missing Champlain. out on Kim Strauss. Just saying, you're missing out. I, yeah, I should, the, yeah. I'm sure the dub is good. I, the, it's it's. Yeah, I mean, the dub. I I I only listen to. 
Samurai Champloo, for anyone who doesn't know, listening is uh, the it's made by the same people who made Cowboy Bebop, and uh, so the, the and the and the English dub of Cowboy Bebop is uh, is Excellent. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, the Samurai Champloo is similarly, from what I've heard, very good. Um, I'm just listening to it in Japanese just because it's it takes place in Japan. It just seems to fit a little bit better. You're missing um, Kim Strauss. Also, that's what I'm saying to you. You're missing Kim him. Strauss. But don't worry, you'll see him again in just B5 give it a switch, throughout John. a lot of it as one of those many background aliens. There's just a few of these actors where they go, you have a weird face. You're going to be in makeup and, <laughs> and no one will notice that you played a Drazi last episode and you're playing this guy here. But if you rewatch I, his performance in this, you will note, oh, that is that Drazi guy. That's him. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> there it is. He's in, you know what, ass, and folks? Yeah. Any uh, any Sentai fans listening? He is in a lot of Power Rangers. This guy is in a lot of Power Rangers. My God, holy cow! Yep. This so guy I thought I would over. reward you with a little bit of a Sean's anime corner on our podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed. Sean enjoy gets it. to blush about some anime voiceover yeah. guy who's in B five because it was a job to do <laughs> while waiting Fantastic. for other. Voices. And it's a shame. I, I'm sa- I'm upset that I missed this one because we talked about this, but I don't think this was discussed in yeah, our. Yeah, we messed up. You missed we it. Messed I, 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 I blame Ben. You. I blame Ben. I redeemed you. This. It's fine. It's fine. Thank I redeemed you. Thank you, you, Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Thank, thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Let's do our spotlight section in which we talk about an actor that appeared in this episode, a guest star performance or a semi-recurring. In this in this instance, it is a one and done, unfortunately. We are go- going to talk about Dwight Schultz, the infamous Amos, or as we've been calling him, Reg, because he's Reginald Barclay from Star Trek, the next generation, Star Trek and Star Trek Voyager. And of course, First Contact. He was in First Contact. Listen, mm-hmm. Star Trek yeah. First Contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As he's got a lot of lines in that movie. <laughs> That's I was right. Surprised. Yeah, he's yeah. in there. So let's kind of go over what we thought of him in this episode. What we thought of his performance. What did you think of him, Rachel? Because we are all familiar with him as Reg. I would imagine we've all referenced him as Reg. But Rachel, what did you think of uh, Amos? I enjoyed Amos, and I enjoyed his performance. As the character, I liked the energy that he brought and that Mm. just kind of chaotic hum that he always had. And it really did bring that feeling of, like, you don't quite know when he's fully going to pop off. Yeah, he's unpredictable. Um, And I think he does a reasonably good job at selling the scenes where he's like preaching in the Zocalo about how there's darkness, e- evil is coming, and the world is gonna end. And <laughs> when he chased down Jakar, <laughs> that was amazing. And Jakar's like, "Please no, I have not done anything wrong. Please don't harass me." And Lando's laughing. Him under Lando's the like, bus. "Gotcha." <laughs> and then he gets chased <laughs> after like, by Lando. Amos, and Lando's like, "Lando, fuck, yikes. Lando, <laughs> come on, Lando, you dummy, you dummy." Oh, yeah. Get your six um, dicks together and get out of there. Um, but you were saying, Rachel, like you, you, en- you enjoyed him. Yeah. Here. You enjoyed his crazy, over the top manic performance. Why didn't it uh, push over the line for you? Because we've had very over the top performances, and you haven't enjoyed them. Is it because you know this face and voice, or I is it because do. of the performance itself? I, I, I have more trust, and it's also because. I can't even remember her fucking name anymore. Moira. Mo- Mo- Moira is so shit. Mariah Cirrus? Uh, uh, Reg knows what he's doing. Yeah. He's doing something, but he knows what he's doing and it works for me most of the time. Interesting. I mean, what about you guys? What do you think of uh, him in this, uh, Steve? What did you think of uh, Dwight Schultz's performance performance as Amos? I think, you know, it's, it's a tough role because it's... It, it, I, w- I wouldn't say it borders on caricature. It is caricature in some ways, like the mentally unwell, unhoused veteran who is just like screaming about the end of the world. Like it's, a, I don't want to say insensitive, but like it's not very nuanced, but I do really like when he does get to the opportunity to have that nuance. Like when he sits down and he talks about his, you know, his time in the war uh, and he, I, I really, this a scene that really jumped out to me in this rewatch was that uh, he kind of wakes up maybe a little more sober and he's mm-hmm. like, oh, what did I do? Uh, he, he was like really charming in that one moment, kind of as like this lovable loser who's just like, yeah, uh, my life sucks. Uh, I don't know what to say. 
Some people do think that I'm just a compulsive liar, but yeah, you know, he had quips for some mm. reason. You yeah, didn't he expect was very him to have quips when you met him. You didn't he expect was... the guy to have quips. Yeah, the, all the the more unhinged stuff I thought was a little broad, but I think literally everything else I thought he did really well at. Yeah, I thought he gave it the, uh, I guess the gravity that it kind of needed in certain moments, like especially when he's kind of giving that speech to, to Garibaldi and telling that story, and like I thought that was pretty pretty well done. Um, yeah, I would say that was pro- probably a I would say a bright spot in the episode was was that I thought he did, uh, I thought he did very good work. Um, just in general, like I thought it was a pretty affecting performance. Um, it just, it wasn't particularly well served by the episode, but um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, poor script. Like, what are you gonna yeah. do? Yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah, there's only so much you gold. can do. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, I thought he did a good work. I, I, it wasn't like one of the greatest performances on the show, but I, I thought he did. I thought he did a good job. Yeah, would he had a s- very funny line? Mm. Oh, sorry. Oh, you going? Oh, where where Garibaldi's like, hey, look. I know some counselors. Why don't I set you up? And he kind of like says, hey, when a, with a man who has everything, what would I need that for? And it was mm. just like really funny. It really charming. I, I liked uh, his really physical self-deprecating. gesture where he's holding his shitty scarf as the representation yeah, like he grabs of the things scarf, that like, he has. I got it all. Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, sorted. I guess I feel like the ugly duckling in the room right now because I don't like his performance in this episode and I've never really liked it. Um, hey, that's fine. Yeah. I have three words for you. Walker Smith energy is what I got from him. <laughs> he came in where he's like, oh, this guy's <laughs> trying. He's doing something. But I never believe a fucking moment of it where it's like him and Garibaldi have this buddy buddy relationship, which I just don't buy. I think that's the problem is the writing for it. I can't see his performance as clearly as everyone else here can, because I just can't buy the comedic shifts of his character that feel completely out of left field for me. And again, I don't know what the episode's trying to really say about the character of Amos, but when it comes to uh, his performance, I also can't help but think of Reg. And I can't help but think of uh, his performance being uh, one of the best in Star Trek, uh, in, 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 in a guest spot role, I mean. And how nuanced it is. Well, here it feels so broad. And mm. when he does get the big monologue, it's like, okay, they've given him something to work with here. And that is true. It's a bright spot yeah. because he's given a thing to do. But the rest of the time I had Walker Smith energy in which the actor may be good or may not be good. Here we have the benefit because we know this actor from other material. I don't know the Walker Smith actor from anything else. So I judge it like, I don't know, is he yeah. is he good or is the script just blinding me to the ability to trust the uh, talents of the actor involved? Because I just could not buy Amos. And there was just this uh, feeling of I was supposed to care more than I did about his own little arc against this monster, which the monster didn't even really have anything to do with him in the end. Like yeah. The monster didn't care about him. The monster didn't come for him like mm-hmm. he thought. And there's no commentary on that. In the end, it, you're supposed to be happy that the monster's killed and uh, that mon- that literal monster's killed. Maybe that means his figurative one is dead too, huh? And I don't know, in a series that has dealt with PTSD in a much more mature way, it feels very simplistic yeah. to come at it with that at the end. It kind of feels like, oh, well, now that that monster's dead, he can he can rehabilitate he can himself. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I ultimately just think like, I think where we all agree on uh, between the four of us is just bad writing. There's not, there's just nothing when you're given nothing, what can you do? And like, I, yeah, it's just poor guy. Like imagine being like, Oh, finally. And I appreciate it on that level. Mm, mm. So, we all know him as Reginald Barclay from Star Trek. That is obvious. But are we familiar with this actor from much else? Uh, Rachel, what about you? Are, are you are that all familiar when you see him outside of this? Do you think of anything other than his turn in Star Trek? Well, he has 217 credits on IMDb. Yeah. And a lot of them were voice acting. Yeah. Particularly in like... The last couple of decades. Yeah. Since the 2000s, to, really. Yeah. Seems to have moved very much into that realm. There's a lot of random things that I'm like, oh, yeah, he was in that. Yeah. 
Interesting. But so I guess you don't know him from much else, but you do technically because yeah. you look at his roster and you go, oh, he is in that. I didn't realize other I was Reg. I've that he's in, but I didn't like take note mm. of him because he's often a kind of guest spot or like one off. Interesting. But he is a series regular in an animated show. Oh, wait, wait. Is he in Sean's favorite anime? No, it's not an anime. Sean's favorite anime, Ben 10? Oh, yeah. Uh, ben 10, yeah. <laughs> it is Ben, ben 10. 10 uh, and, ben 10. Uh, hey. um, yeah, no, uh, I noticed the the uh, looking through uh, uh, Dwight's credits on IMDb, of all the video game ones he did, he was in one of the 50 Cent games. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, he was in 50 Cent Blood in the Sand. That's the best one. Oh, That's my the best God. One. <laughs> Which is, was I he... believe, the game where 50 Cent goes to the Middle East. <laughs> oh, was, he, was he 50 Cent? Uh, yeah, like, uh, well, yeah, yes. Was <laughs> is he played 50 Cent? Listen, all it says, here's the thing. All it says is, is 50 the... Cent, Blood on the Sand, voice. That's all it says. <laughs> Could have been anything. So <laughs> you fill it does not give a character name, so you fill in the blanks. Uh that fuck. You lucky motherfucker. Okay, let's roll. You got transport? Steve, what about you? Outside of Star Trek, do you know Dwight Schultz from much? Is there something that you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside of Reg. Yeah, that uh, I mean, I know he's a nutty conservative Republican. <laughs> yeah. Um, who's That's, yes. been on record to be like I don't get work anymore because I vote uh, for conservative things. It's like, okay, Uh, that's about it. Um, So you know his real life kind of weirdness rather than any of his other characters or performances? Yeah, like I'm looking at this up. Like I'm sure I've heard him in like. So no one's an A team fan. No, no one's a fan of the A team. Uh, you know, I've never seen the A team because 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 Howling Mad Murder because that's what people knew him for before Reg. He was one of the main A-Team people, and his character was the yeah, crazy geez. soldier oh, 97, man. 97 episodes of yep. the A-Team. Mm-hmm. He was the crazy soldier weirdo man, and that's why his performance here is such a comfortable thing for him, because yeah. that's ba- he's oh, basically playing great. his A-Team role, where he's the crazy guy who's torn up by uh, things and oh, all of that. A fun fact about yeah. that is that, like, that character wears a lot of distinctive T-shirts. Yeah. And is, is one of them a Star Trek shirt? No, <laughs> no. Um, Dwight like designed all of them and okayed oh, all of them. Like really? he was in charge and took control of the t-shirts. That's super weird. Oh, but I like funny. that a lot. That's, did that's did he cute, demand yeah. that his he shirts for this show? He called it his consistent not- contribution to the series. Yeah. <laughs> that's cute. One of my favorite quotes. I don't know if you have it there, but he talked about the lead guy from the A team, like the head of the A team. He met the actor, and the first thing the actor said to him was, he walked up to him and said. Just so you know, I'm not a very nice man. And then walked off. <laughs> like, like that was his power stance of, just so you know, I'm not a nice person. Walked off. What we call that is big William Sanderson energy. And then he, yeah, he had course, a cameo in yeah. the 2010 18 movie. Yes, he did. Yes, he was in a, I saw that movie. He is in that film. Yes. But, um, I I look at his IMDb and it is just amazing how much stuff he is in that I have played or watched and I, and I Avatar, didn't realize. Avatar, Rugrats, yeah. Cat Dog, Ben and he Ten, the Squirrel, yeah, yeah. He's in he's in. He's uh, also in the Powerpuff Girls. Reboot. Powerpuff Girls reboot. Like yeah. he is. He's just a working guy. Even then, the other thing that I did know is what Steve uh, touched upon, but, which is in real life he is a extremely weird Republican conservative guy. And I don't. Yeah. You know that's American politics. That doesn't matter to me. But the one thing I do know is he talks about it a lot Mm -hmm. and he talks about how unfair it is for him but one of the things I think that's interesting is he did the voice or he does the voice in video games specifically for the character of Vulture in the Spider-Man games which I think is weirdly specific of Mm -hmm. him as Vulture which is cool but uh in a previous uh episode of babylon 5 we had in the spider-man uh the the recent spider-man game the ps4 one the sony spider-man game Mm -hmm. uh the criminal guy in uh quality of mercy who's going to get mind wiped he was the voice of norman osborn in the same game so there are some right yeah yeah. little connections in that way but uh there are a few other things that i want to mention yeah i just wanted to know uh, he had his first credit when he was 34 
Really? Yeah. Okay. He was born in 1947, and his first credit that I saw on IMDb was the 1981 uh, TV film, I think, Thin Ice, where he played Mr. Ritchie. Really? Mm. I guess that makes sense. I, I guess I never think about how old he is in, uh, in, in TNG, because he has this weird kind of, he's extremely old, yet extremely l- young look, because he's clearly balding, but he's got this young quality. I don't know. He's yeah, yeah. He's, he's got a lot of youthful energy. And yeah. It, it seems to be a sort of pattern with him of, of diving into like one kind of media mm. for his roles. So like he did a stint in film, did a stint in TV, and now it's, it's video games. like video games. And before that, it was voice acting. But apparently he also had like 15 years where he was just doing strictly theatre. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at his catalogue now. I didn't realise that he was one of my favourite things about Batman Arkham Knight. He was Professor Pig, the really <laughs> creepy serial killer in that game. It all adds up. And the last one that I want to note. Other is- than Ben 10, the greatest anime, yeah. Yeah, I, we already <laughs> mentioned it. Sean's That's already first. had his anime corner. Go That's on. First, uh, he was in an uh, episode or two of Diagnosis Murder. Oh, my favorite show! It all connects yeah, back together again. But he wasn't go. in anything JMS worked on before this. He wasn't in Murder She Wrote. There's a lot of Murder She Wrote actors in B five. Oh, I, ca- I got to start looking out for that. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that JMS wrote episodes of that. Um, then they guest starred in B five as well. But uh, that's so funny. That's it for Dwight Schultz. Unless you guys have any further things you want to add about him, just a quick Sean. He was in Princess Mononoke. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Was he yeah, the princess? Yeah. Uh, hey, additional voices. That could be anyone. He Ooh, could, could be the yeah, princess. Probably, could be a lot. Could be Fifty Cent. We don't he know. played Fifty <laughs> Cent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Fifty <laughs> Cent in Princess Decision, Mononoke. But uh, hey, who knows? That bitch has got my skull, and I want it back. We have our rating system. Of yum being bad, yum yum being good. It's a very imperfect system for some people, but a perfect one for me because it reminds us of things being yum or yummy or y- y- yum yum. Yummy's in the middle, but we don't do a middle ground rating. We only go yum or yum yum. So, what is this episode? The long dark. Is it yum meaning bad or yum yum being good? Yum. Yum. <laughs> it's got to be a hard yum for me. Yum. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a yum. Yum. Wow. I guess I'm the ugly duckling in the room here because I'm going to give this one a big, what? big... No, it's what? a yum. It's a yum. Yum. If you, if you combine them all together, it's two yum yums. So. Exactly. So it all no, works out in the end. No, Could you imagine not, if I did give it a yum no. yum and I pulled off my mask and it was me, Scott Frost, in the room the entire time? Oh, and I was like, no. guys, this episode's yeah, great. Don't you Scott, love this? Scott, we would have wanted to yeah. talk to you about <laughs> Twin Peaks instead. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Please elaborate on your work on Twitter. Yeah, was yeah. he? Oh, don't even get us started about Rust Hamblin. You'll have to find out. But Rachel gave us a shocking revelation about her sexual attraction to Rust Hamblin. Ooh. Oh, okay. Don't we all? Oh, sure. Don't we all get turned well, on by Doctor Jacoby shovelling his way out of the well, shit? Well, well, yeah. Well, yeah. he's riff. He was riff in West he Side was Story. Riff. Yeah. Well, he's well, goddamn what, riff. What do you think about Dwight in terms of sexual sexual appeal? Hmm. He does have very fluffy hair in this particular episode, which I, you know... You connect with. I'm sweating under the collar, Rachel. I'm going to have to give him a (laughs) yum-yum on the sex meter. (laughs) Yum-yum. There you go. Oh, I'll oh, give, I will also I give done? give him a yum yum. Yum yum. My pepper goes away once I find out you you love Donald Trump. So it's like, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, well, bye bye. Fair enough. Oh, you're gonna enough. have a hard time with Bruce Boxleitner then, huh? Oh no, no. <laughs> Bruce no. <laughs> Bruce, no, I'll have to make no. an exception. Bruce, no, not no. Bruce. Bruce and Jerry Doyle, who uh, I do believe JMS described oh, okay. uh, just far right of Attila the Hun. Um, oh god. Boy. So enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. I would love to hear what the next episode of Babylon 5 that you and I will be talking about, Rachel. Sean, we've given you yes. the DVD description. You have the burden upon your shoulders <laughs> to read sure. this. And you have this actually is... seen this episode, so you can mm-hmm. comment upon how accurate this is. Go on. On the next Babylon 5. Episode 6 of Season 2. It's a spider in the web. Mm-hmm. Who or what is disrupting negotiations? that a Mars colony representative, Adrian Barbeau, hopes will bring peace to the planet. The secret rests with an individual, Michael Beck, more dead than alive, a cyber zombie run by a remote computer. 
Oh, oh, oh man, I have to I have to remind myself of this. Even though I've recently watched this, I have to be like, this is a Talia episode, apparently. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Oh yeah. yeah. Where I think one? this is the intro or one of the introductions to her famous black and yellow outfit, where she yeah. looks yeah, like an X Men villain. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll yes. be talking about. See, that Sean, when... I'm not the only one. I no. I bring that up all the time on our podcast. They're like, I don't know. She looks like an X Men and or a Nazi. So it's one of the two. So, uh, sure. Maddie, oh, she's definitely Nazi. Oh, uh, well, you saying the cycle look Nazi ish in any way? No, they look nice and friendly. Good old Cycor. You guys never cease to amaze me. All the moral fiber of Jack the Ripper. What do you do in your spare time? Juggle babies over a fire pit? Oops, there goes another calculated risk. You're not helping the situation. Lady, you are the situation. If you are wanting to engage with a Babylon 5 podcast that does not have the spoilers, they are looking at it through the first-time viewer lens because Ben, the uh, host that has seen B5, keeps his he keeps his mouth uh, he keeps his mouth tight on this one, pretty closed lip on the uh, spoiler front there for you guys. Make sure to check out Sean and Steve over at the Last Best Babylon 5 podcast. It's a really fun time. I'm enjoying it. Rachel, you're enjoying it. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 we love the running gags and uh we can't wait to see more of the uh the cinematic universe that is the san pellegrino storyline oh, it's been mapped you. out for five years oh, i can't wait a five-year plan yeah a five-year <laughs> exactly. plan of so, yeah. oh yeah yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> you better you better not <laughs> yeah Jesus we have uh, five years <laughs> five years of this shit yeah, absolutely. Oh, You'll be well, able to understand we'll all of this animosity it. towards San Pellegrino if you go over and check out their podcast. All of this information for the, the show and our show is in the description of this episode. You can find us on the social media platforms of your choice under Yum Yum Podcast or Yum Yum Pod. We are always posting things on there. Uh, you guys, you guys are on social media too. What ones are, are you under and how can people find you? Yeah, we're on Instagram and Twitter uh, at LastBestB5. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm on Twitter at S.A. Winchell, W-I-N-C-H-E-L-L. And uh, we have some fun. We have fun, right? Yeah. We have and fun. I'm under uh, Jabroni Sean is where you can find me. You're a jabroni. And, uh, yeah. hey. That's why. That's right. And uh, yeah, you guys post stuff on there. It's always fun to interact. I mean, these guys have had the fortune of having Patricia Tolman comment on one of their posts on Instagram. We haven't had that. I'm just saying it's a disappointment we that we did haven't have had Bruce. Like. That's right. We Bruce did. Boxlight yeah, Bruce, likes all of our Bruce, posts yeah, he, for some reason. I don't know why, but I'm glad. We got a Bruce like and we we're like, this is the best day of our life. <laughs> So I'm glad to hear that yeah. he's, you know, game recognized game. Good yeah, game recognized game. So yeah. uh, make sure to check us out. We uh, have an email if you want to talk to us directly. Our mm-hmm. email is yumyumpod at gmail.com. We have a Patreon in which we do content on there. We're going through the X Men movies at the moment. We're going oh, through fun. them. Uh, we're having uh-huh. a fun time. Ooh. We are also uh, going through the best and worst rated episodes of any given Star Trek at random. Which will be coming to a close. Yeah. Yeah, we've already done Code of Honor, so you can come over and listen to us talk about Code of Honor. And Meridian. Oh, and Meridian, Sean. Great. You love that episode, and you'll love how I mildly defend it. Come on over. Come on over, Sean. What was the worst Enterprise episode? Oh, I think there's a special episode called, and these are the voyages that everybody loves. Yep, yep. yep. Oh, I I, I haven't even seen... All of Enterprise. Got it. I know that episode. Um, yeah. that is I a, have that a spicy is a take episode. that one of the top five rated episodes of uh, Enterprise I found to be terrible. And you can come over to the Patreon and find out what that is, people. Yum Yum Pod Can't on wait. Patreon. All of this, again, in the description of the episode. Jukar was here, but he didn't say the famous phrase. No, he uh, just lightly stroked his book because you do not thump that book. No, he was looking for the phrase in his version of the Bible, but I guess he didn't find it to say it out loud, but I'll say it to our friends over at the Last Best B5 podcast. Good eating to you, gentlemen. Good eating to you all too. Good e- good eating. Thank you. Thank good you eating. for having good us. Good eating to all. Thank you for having us. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Good eating to all listeners. And to all a good eat. <laughs> <laughs> all a good eat. <laughs>